Strategy and Insider, exploring future trends and their impacts. Hi everyone, this is the 16th episode of the Strategy and Insider podcast. My name is Thomas, I'm a partner with Strategy and and your host for this season. We're proud to be back with several new episodes featuring discussions with top class thought leaders from the healthcare industry. And after having recent conversations with the chief strategy and digital officer of an online pharmacy and a professor of quantitative biomedicine, I'm looking forward to talking to another seasoned strategist within the pharma industry. And today's episode can finally be recorded in a live setting again. And hence, I'm more than happy to sit in front of my next guest in a really very nicely refurbished conference room here in Brussels. He describes himself as a scientist by training and philosopher at heart. And I'm really curious to learn more about him and his perspectives in this episode. So please welcome James Sackheim, who kindly agreed to join the Strategy and Insider podcast to discuss his his perspectives on the future of health with me today here in Brussels. James is the head of corporate strategy at UCB, which is a global biopharma company headquartered in Belgium. Founded in 1928, UCB focuses primarily on neurology, uh, including epilepsy, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease and others, but also immunology disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease or psoriasis and other this. And by leveraging scientific advances in those areas such as the genetics and biomarkers in human biology, according to their statements. James is, to me, a true primary rock at UCB and already counts more than 17 years at the firm, spanning every aspect of the pharma value chain and lately being responsible for UCB's corporate strategy as said. His journey with the firm led him from neuroscience and computer science to people management and leadership of complex global projects and launches. And previously, prior to joining, he actually studied neuroscience at the Rutgers University in New Jersey and also obtained a PhD in neuroscience from there. So with all that said, thank you for being here today, James. I'm really very much looking forward to learning more about you, UCB, but also your view on the future of health. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to the opportunity and the conversation. So, hey, uh, James, after all the yeah very relevant lockdown measures that we undergone uh, during the past month, it actually feels really good to sit face to face. And when you personally look back on the pandemic, what for you personally were kind of your major challenges, but also kind of the positive aha moments during that time? Yeah. Thanks for asking the question. I, mean, I feel like this is such a rich topic, right? We could probably spend the whole podcast just, oh, yeah, just on this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a couple of a couple of aha moments, I think, and some of them are personal, personal, some of them uh, professional, ha personal. Um, the one that stands out most for me is around privilege, right? The, the realization during the pandemic that I was not in a sector of the of, of industry where my job was at threat from the from the pandemic that. Uh, I was fortunate to not get sick, but also fortunate that if I did, I had support, I had resources, right? Um, yeah. Financial security, and, and for many people, it was uh, a much worse experience than that, not just health-wise, but in terms of anxiety. So for me, that's that's salient, right? Yeah. There's also um, some beautiful moments that happened, right? Like the best of humanity were kind of, was shining through in the, in the pandemic, and those were aha moments. There was a particular evening in my neighborhood early on during lockdown, when a singer was giving an impromptu concert from her balcony. So she'd dragged the, al the amplifier onto the balcony and there was a crowd gathering and she was oh, singing and nice. had a beautiful, and like that, that stuff doesn't happen, unfortunately, anymore or in routine. And it took a pandemic to, to illustrate it, but it, it reminded me of, of the best of humanity and the yeah. best of people. Um, there were some tougher ahas, I think, from the, from the pandemic. Um, one of them that, uh, impacted me in particular, I suppose, because of my science and philosophy background is, is the role that science plays in society. And I, I think I and maybe a lot of people have been, had spent a long time hoping and wishing that science would play a more prominent role, that more people would be scientifically literate. Mm -hmm. And an aha in the pandemic for me was, be careful what you wish for maybe, because a little bit of science in the hands of those that maybe aren't well-trained 
in scientific method and how to interpret it, or in the hands of people with a willful agenda um, rather than an open mind can actually be highly counterproductive. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the other um, more difficult um, aha was probably around the questions that the pandemic raised in terms of how we value human life, right? So yeah. all these public policy decisions um, where you have to make trade-offs between personal freedom and, and lockdown and, and what's underneath all of them, right? Is what, at what length are we willing to go to, to preserve human life? And would people uh, behave differently depending on which parts of the population are, are most at risk? So there were real issues at the root of how society deals with health. The pandemic also sharpened our focus of uh, where to focus, uh, what to decide on, what's really important in life. Um, and I can very much relate uh, to the singer on the balcony because in where I live or we live, uh, there was not a singer, but uh, someone who played a trumpet. Uh, um, and he was uh, always going out uh, on a Monday evening at five or six ish, uh, playing the trumpet for the whole street. Yeah? And, and people have been listening. And, and yeah, as you said, um, this would have never happened. Huh? Um, probably it will not happen again, yeah. but um, yeah, there, there is, as you say, good and bad aha moments uh, from that time. I would love for myself, and I think for all of us, to try and spend a bit more time trying to understand why that doesn't happen. Not why it did happen during the pandemic, but why it doesn't happen today. Like, why won't it happen today? In normal you know? times, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, we yeah. would appreciate that as well, I'm, I'm sure. Hey, and um, you, you also referenced uh, kind of your combination of being a scientist by training, but also the philosophical part of yourself. How do you think uh, kind of the philosophy um, that you're interested in, that you're passionate about, uh, does help you excel in your job and what you do every day? Well, so first, I mean, I appreciate the premise that I excel in my job. I'm not sure I do, but at least I try. But I'm happy to talk about... So I think there's, there's, there's two elements, right? Yeah. Um, and and it, again, it links very much to um, the, the pandemic and post-pandemic and post-truth era that we're in, right? So... Um, a lot of the science that I learned, unfortunately, is a bit out of date, right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, 20 odd years ago for me, but the skills to interpret science, right? Um, the realization, especially in a society that is so information dense, right? And increasingly so, that the realization that everything is, is really an experiment, right? It's either controlled or not, but, but almost everything in every day, personally or, personally or professionally, is some form of experiment. And there are good and bad experiments with valid and not so valid ways to interpret those results, right? And I think that mindset of being able to interpret what's, what's a valid conclusion to draw um, and how much weight can you put on it, that for me has been uh, indispensable, mm -hmm. um, helping me navigate my, my career in a lot of different jobs. Uh, and equally, uh, philosophy um, in a world where, you know, there's, there's less there seems to be more distrust of facts, mm -hmm. right? More ambiguity, more complexity, yet perversely, everyone seems surer and surer of their opinion on, on key complex issues, oh, right? True. And so how to reflect on the underpinnings of that knowledge and what we should be certain about and what we should be less certain about and and not to, not to question everything, but the right way to ask questions about what we should and shouldn't be sure about. I think philosophy is is core to that um and then on the kind of the ethical side right so um there's immense power in healthcare and immense complexity and anytime there's a lot a lot of complexity and power you can't really trace back accountability mm -hmm. so there's this piece around how to act morally in such a complex environment right how to uh, be responsible and accountable um it requires a kind of systems thinking right and um, I think in a lot of corporations, including at UCB, where um, we're training all of our leaders in multi-level systems thinking, to me, that's a, f a philosophy enterprise, yeah. right? And so all of that uh, helps. And it, um, of course, I'm clearly biased on this issue, right? Um, but I remember when I was in high school and we had a senior executive from Unilever come to give okay. a, a careers talk, right? And the memorable moment of the talk was he, his last slide was a, a table 
in which on the left side, he listed all the potential careers that um, any of us had mentioned that we might be interested in going to. And he was going to reveal on the right hand side of the table what we should study as an undergraduate to best prepare ourselves for, for that uh, career. Did you right? make the right choice? <laughs> well, the, the, the punchline to his talk was that the answer, his answer was engineering for every career. It didn't matter what we chose. It was engineering, 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 engineering. So there's and the golden, golden bullet, actually. Eh? From his perspective. So I have my own biased version of that same table in which I put philosophy next to um, next to every career choice. Um, you know, I'm reading a, a, a fascinating book uh, by Daniel Mendelssohn uh, called An Odyssey. He's a classicist by training. His perspective is classics is, is what everybody should study no matter what your career. But I, I think the, the issues I just mentioned are that it's not the technical knowledge that matters most, right? It's this way of thinking. And in, in this world, in this moment, complex, yeah. ambiguous, post-truth, post-fact, um, philosophy is, I find, an indispensable skill. Yeah. And information can be found anywhere, elsewhere uh, in, in the World Wide Web, but the way to find it, the way to interpret it, and, and the way to use it is probably what counts counts most in these days. Yeah, So not the uh, not the pure knowledge, but also what you do with it. Yeah? And, and that goes back to yeah, what, the what, philosophical and ethical questions. Yeah, what, what's the root of that? Not what, yeah. what even counts as knowledge as opposed to a belief or opinion? It's getting yeah. blurrier and blurrier. And it's not just um, it's not just mindfulness. It's a, it's a skill. Yeah a skill of filtering in the right way, I yeah, guess, exactly. and interpreting yeah. the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and b before we kind of look into the future, I I, I just want to uh, look once back in your in your previous life, because you started your career um, as an expedition volunteer at Raleigh International, mm -hmm. which is a, a global youth-driven organization that is dedicated to building a better and more sustainable world, according to to their tagline and you worked in Zimbabwe for a couple of uh, months. How has this time um, very early in your career shaped kind of your career choices afterwards? And uh, have you learned anything there um, that uh, still until now still drives you today? I really appreciate you asking the question because it was a formative experience for me. Okay. Um, and it was also It was part of a pattern that I find recurring in my career. I'm not exactly sure yet um, the root cause of that pattern, but the pattern for me is um, a series of choices that are relatively um, predictable, make sense, right? Follow a linear path, and then all of a sudden do something quite different, right? So I had kind of gone through a route of spending my summers uh, with friends at, at camp, right, um, in my... Uh, adolescence, and then all of a sudden decided to do something totally different and, and go to Africa for a yeah. summer as a, as a volunteer. And in my career, right, uh, scientific and medical job, scientific and medical job, all of a sudden something totally different in, in global project leadership. And then a series of global roles in neurology, in leadership positions, and then all of a sudden taking a job in access and pricing, which quite frankly, I knew very little about, right? Yeah. Uh, but became fascinated by, <laughs> because our CEO was just asking amazing questions that were really thought provoking in, uh, in preparing for launch. Um, and so that was not another left turn for me. And it's actually, um, I digress a bit, but it's a, a, a moment also to, to express gratitude for a company that would even allow someone without a, a deep training in access and pricing to take on a role uh, like that. But it's a, you know, I'm grateful for a company that, that has that trust of me. Uh, but back to your question, um, I learned some important things about myself. And, and perhaps the most important is I was not really as kind and em empathetic a person as I thought I was, right? I was, Before you went there. You yeah, mean, I had a pretty high opinion of myself. Right? Okay. I was uh, barely 20, I think, right? Uh, ready th to rule the world. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that kind of you know, youth, <laughs> youthful uh, yeah. energy and... Yeah. Uh, Uh, kind of uh, gung-ho confidence, right? But a bit of uh, arrogance and hubris thrown in probably. Um, and I think the, the physical hardship of the situation, the surroundings we were in, the poverty that we saw, but also the diversity of people there yeah. that came from all kinds of backgrounds, privileged and very far from privileged. Um, and so I just had experiences at an interpersonal level that made me realize I was not as uh, kind-hearted or empathetic person as I, as I thought. And mm -hmm. so that kind of gave me the uh, shot across the bow, I think, yeah. to course correct at, a, at least while there was still enough time to, 
to further develop myself. So that that was super important to me. Um, and also just um, the capacity to be enlightened from surprising places, right? So, I mean, I I grew up in a, uh, I had the, the opportunity to go to, you know, um, a, a well-funded private school, mm -hmm. right? Surrounded by affluent, well-educated people. Um, and so that now I was in this environment with all all different kinds of people. Um, and so it opened my eyes to what different people could bring to a project. Mm. Whether we were sitting around you know, a fire in the evening talking about life or whether we were having to design a shelter for a, um, an old people's home in a, in, a, in a rural community in Zimbabwe, yeah. the skills I learned in my you know, posh private school weren't gonna get it done, yeah. right? So people brought to the table a lot of different uh, perspectives. And so it, it just broadened my appreciation for where insight and enlightenment and, and values can, and value can come from. Um, and so those are things that I think in terms of my value set are quite, quite formative for me, not st strictly uh, work and career lessons, but just uh, personal values. So what I'm hearing is that uh, it clearly kind of grounded you, uh, gave you some characteristics that you haven't, that you didn't build until then, but also it helped you really getting problems solved that are present um, and pressing at the very moment, yeah, kind of sheltering uh, an old people's home. You referenced earlier uh, from normal life, um, hopefully we can preserve some of the singers on the balcony yeah, mm -hmm. and the trumpet players on the street. Um, in professional life and, and healthcare in particular, I would wish for preserving the appreciation and the trust building that happened uh, during that time between the different healthcare stakeholders, because it has showcased to me what can be achieved if you pull jointly towards something, mm -hmm. um, speeding up uh, uh, development cycles, uh, speeding up um, uh, approval cycles, anything is possible if you work towards the same goal, mm -hmm. it seemed. Uh, and yes. this, is, this is what I would personally wish for, preserving from that pandemic for mm -hmm. the healthcare industry. But um, probably also switching more towards the, the supply chain of pharma, and it actually did not collapse, yeah? mm -hmm. luckily, um, in, in, at least in big terms, um, even under the pressure of COVID. But the pandemic has revealed some serious weaknesses also in the pharma logistics. For instance, when China uh, stopped their exports of personal protective equipment um, at the onset of the pandemic, With that in mind, how do you basically plan to uh, properly strike the balance between optimizing the cost on the one hand, but mm -hmm. also increasing the resilience of your supply chains uh, on the other hand? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. I think um, not uh, not just for biopharma, but the this trade-off that you're alluding to between optimization and efficiency of supply chain versus the resilience or the anti-fragility of yeah. supply chain, I think it's going to become an emerging strategic choice that many companies have to make um, because globalization and outsourcing have presented a lot of opportunities for super efficiency right yeah. and as you stretch that efficiency thinner and thinner you lose your your lose your resilience right and how you manage that trade off which in turn requires a um, more sophisticated quantitative risk assessment, which is something we're working on here at, at UCB, but it's uh, these are all the fundamental underpinnings of a company strategy. It's the, it's the kind of juicy trade-off that you want to, to get into as a, uh, as a strategist. It reminds me a bit of something I, I read a while ago, um, just an opportunity to, to mention a, a strange but compelling article I found. I think it was in HBR, mm -hmm. um, and it was ostensibly about something totally different. It was about... Um, I think CEO signatures, right? And what it revealed about their personality. Um, but what they were trying to do was correlate, right? The personality of the CEO with the, the long-term uh, prosperity of the company. Oh, that's and, interesting. Right? And, and what they realized is, well, the answers depended totally on what measure they used for prosperity of the company. Mm -hmm. And they ended up getting totally different results depending on whether they were looking at short-term growth or the ability of the company to stick around decade over decade, right? So their list of best performers that were still, you know, in the upper quadrant of their industry 20 years later versus the top 10 fastest risers in their sector, totally different groups of companies, right? Uh. And, I, and I link it to your question because you've basically got those that are uh, trying to grow really fast but might not be the most resilient, Right versus those that might not be as efficient, might not be growing as fast, but they've got more resilience, right? And so they're going to stick around for longer. So what, in the end, what are you maximizing for, right? 
Um, I think so. It's anyway. It's a. I think an interesting trade-off, right? That, that there's a supply chain aspect, but also a, just a corporate strategy aspect. And as you are the head of corporate strategy and UCB, you will be also uh, on spot, uh, kind of forming that uh, very future for UCB, and and yeah, very much looking forward to seeing that uh, over the the years to come here. Yeah, and I think yeah, yeah in, indeed, I I look forward to kind of tackling some of some of the issues, and I I think there's. Um, There's some interesting aspects, um, one for biopharma overall. Right? I mean, the, the first is industry margins are under a lot of scrutiny, right? But I think the question you're raising um, is an important point in defending why a, a reasonable margin is important, right? Because we're not, we're not talking about supply chain for denim, right? We're yeah. talking about supply chain of healthcare equipment and, and medicine. So you wouldn't want it to be uber lean and efficient you want some resilience in it and therefore there has to be some margin associated to to create that buffer and that and that resilience um and i, I think probably some of the trade-offs are encapsulated in the strategy we have here which is not unitary right uh, it's blended based on where the product is in its life cycle based on the population we're serving based on which markets it's uh, it, it's launched and available in so We tend to adapt from single to multi-source, um, whether we're the only option for, for patient populations or not. There's not, I think, one answer. It requires a bit of understanding the, the needs of each population in each market. Switching gears towards that that very future of healthcare, and that was the original discussion that we had a couple of months back, yes, but also yeah. kind of the the underpinning um, pattern of the strategy and insider podcast around that future of health. Uh, we're currently redoing our, our flagship study there, and uh, what we've seen is that there is an emergence of what we call a life care ecosystem that is constituting both a disease care cycle but also a well care cycle. Mm -hmm. And we do believe, and others as well, actually, that this will fundamentally reshape the traditional pharma, biopharma business model. And by putting the human really at the center of that life care system, we see a true shift and also a convergence of the acute care, but also the well care setting. How, from your perspective, will those developments towards a more preventative and at the same time less curative um, medicine will affect the pharma industry as a whole and secondly to that how will the experience of patients or merely people in the well care cycle evolve from your perspective mm. yeah this is a, a another a great question and a, a rich subject i think of uh, worthy of reflection right for the for the whole industry my personal view i'm not sure i see prevention necessarily displacing cure Right, I see. I do see the rise of focus on prevention and wellness, right? But I, I kind of see them both growing together, right? Um, as well, mm -hmm. and um, there's always going to be more to cure, right? I mean, just in a, in a logical sense, right? What, whatever you prevent will uh, improve longevity, which will expose then that person or that segment of population to whatever's next, right? Yeah, the next um, disease, yeah. Yeah, until until we figure out immortality, there's yeah. going to be something to cure, right? Um, <laughs> So, and I think you're alluding to that in terms of this cycle, right, yeah. where they go together. I, I think there are things um, that underpin both that, that become important, right? Um, and certainly at UCB, it's very much top of our mind, right? So um, really getting to etiology and the root cause of disease, right? Whether you're interested in prevention or whether you're interested in moving from symptom treatment to disease modification and, and um, freedom from disease, it, you have to understand etiology. But etiology has to be understood at a, and this is maybe where the, the prevention and societal piece comes in, has to be understood not just at a biologic level, but at a, at a social level in terms of social determinants, right? So if you really want to understand what's the cause of a patient being in a, not the cause of them having a set of symptoms, but the cause of them being in a situation, right? Then you've got the social factors and the biological factors that led them to be where they are. And so yeah. understanding all of the root causes, the biologic ones and the social the social ones becomes really important whether you want to prevent or whether you want to cure. And so I think um, there there's, you know, doors that open up opportunities for, for big data and AI to better understand that etiology. Um, there's probably also opportunity around uh, some, some uh, better goal alignment, as we alluded to before, between uh, 
uh, public and private interests. Um, and also, I think, uh, and this is of, of personal fascination to me, the, the human psychology uh, aspect, right? I mean, I think uh, it's probably more trendy to call it behavioral economics, but to me, it's human <laughs> psychology. Um, but you know, the art of nudging and understanding personal biases, cognitive biases, um, and how to influence people. I mean, these are major drivers of um, of, of social change, right, and yeah. behavioral change. And if we want to understand, it's highly relevant in prevention, right, because prevention is not just a kind of biomedical aspect, it's a behavioral and social piece too. But I think it all comes together, right? Whether you're trying to tackle the etiology of the disease or, or work, work on prevention, the, the real underpinnings of how the biology and the social context come together become become really important. I, I also wanted to, to add a, a couple of other comments if I can, because I think Absolutely. they're, they're, they're timely. Um, one is, I, I really hope, I, I don't know how confident I am, but I really hope this move towards prevention can be rolled out more equitably than, than we roll out mm -hmm. um, uh, symptom treatment and cure. I'm, I'm not sure the early days of a vaccine deployment globally are a great signal for, no, for that, but surely not. Um, where there's a will, there's a way. So I, I think that will become important. And then I, I read recently, I don't, I don't know how credible the, um, the source is, but I'd read that the, it's not always the case that prevention is more cost effective than, than treatment. And I, and it caught my attention not to kind of challenge the premise of your question, but because um, when I think about the question, I immediately assume well, prevention, good thing, right? Uh, be much more cost effective, better for everybody. Um, but there's, a, I think, a case study in tuberculosis where it's been shown that it's more cost effective to treat than, than to prevent, right? So I think it's just a small caveat to say, rather than jumping all into, okay, this is the next exciting thing, right? It's more in certain cases, it makes much more sense, right? Certainly, it's more cost effective to prevent lung cancer from smoking than it is to treat the lung cancer, yeah. right? Um, but there are other cases where it's not necessarily the case. So it's a it's a complex issue, yeah. um, and I'm going to be f I'm fascinated to see how it how it unfolds. But I, I think there are common there are common routes between prevention and yeah. uh, and treatment. And and I, I I'm totally with you that it might not always be cost effective, but uh, part of that equation also obviously needs to be the well being of the patient and the quality of mm -hmm. that life. Yeah, uh, be it prevented or be it um, under under treatment and clearly it needs to be yeah uh, looked in kind of in sync yeah, of all of that but i'm, I'm with you um uh, prevention is probably not the holy grail to everything yeah, and it needs to be cost effective uh, hopefully and i do share that perspective we will be more able to equitably um kind of spread that uh, globally um than, than than medications hopefully it's less um heavy on logistical and supply chain issues because there is clearly mm. uh, some problems uh, bringing medicines to the world yeah uh, in every angle of the world probably it's it's better doable with preventative measures that's at least my it, dear hope it yeah. is I, and i'm probably biased by my 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 former hat right um before this role working in access and pricing um because i mean at, at ucb we've we've put a lot into understanding the appropriate ways to value medicines right and from that work the the realization is we still haven't really even mastered the the right way to holistically value treatment of of, of complex symptomatology mm -hmm. let alone value cure let alone properly value prevention right so underlying the economics of all of this is what is prevention worth right what is society mm -hmm. willing to pay for it right <clears throat> um, and that's a, another fascinating question that i think will deeply influence how this uh, this trend plays out and we could go on only on this topic for, for another hour, <laughs> yeah. I assume, right? Yeah. But you, you, you mentioned something um, interesting. Um, you referenced it as the rise of big data and AI. And I do believe that uh, the discovery, the development, but also the, the, the surveillance post-marketing uh, uh, of a pharma uh, um, product will require an ever-increasing amount of data that needs to be captured, um, cleansed, um, integrated, and, and, and also interpreted. How are you as a company uh, strengthening, but also streamlining your data and, and the information management process to uh, basically prepare for the increasing complexity that will surely come in the coming years? Hmm. Yeah, so I, we're doing a few, I think, of the, the solid right basic 
things, right, to, to manage complexity, right? So we've relatively recently um, set up a data office and have a chief data officer so that we can work efficiently and transversely across all of the different facets of the company in which data and digitization uh, play a role. Um, I also think, or I, I know as a company, um, I, I like the credo that we have, um, where it's not just about automating our core processes as much as we can. So for example, in uh, benefit risk decisions, um, um, within you know safety and development, there's a, there's a lot of automa automation of processes there. But the automation is, is not just for efficiency and to manage complexity, is to also allow humans to focus on the stuff that humans are uniquely good at, right? So we're increasingly want, uh, seeking to uh, include patients in complex benefit risk uh, decisions, right? And the time and space to do that is created by the ability to use digital techniques to automate the stuff that frees up human space and time. Um, there's also uh, a great opportunity that we're, we're, we're trying to capitalize to not just gather data through, I don't want to call RWE traditional at this point, but you know, mainstream yeah. ways, RWE, past studies, things like that. But there's also the opportunity that we're trying to uh, capitalize more on, which is in every routine patient interaction, every time the patient touches our medicine, right? Yeah. Every time they go to a pharmacy to pick up a prescription, there's an opportunity to learn something, right? Um, if they call us for one reason with one question, there's an opportunity to ask them another. And certainly it's a regulated environment and there are, there are limits, but there's a huge opportunity that I think uh, uh, a company like UCB that's deeply invested in understanding the patient can can capitalize on in, in, in getting information there. Um, but there's also another key aspect for us, which is we're never gonna be the world leading company in, in digital and data technology. We're a biopharma company, that's yeah. our core business and our strength. Um, so we're seeking to partner um, in the right, uh, with the right companies at the right moment in the right, in the right domains mm -hmm. where they have the tech leadership. So we have a, a relatively new collaboration with Microsoft mm -hmm. um, in which in particular for biology and chemistry data sets um, where it's high dimensional um, unstructured data and they have the kind of the cloud capacity and the 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 AI um, to help us navigate those data sets and and look for new candidates and new targets. And so for me, that's a good match between our strength in patient insight driven R and D and and their strength on the on the cloud AI, AI side of managing unstructured data uh, makes more sense than us trying to be masters of that universe ourselves. And glad that you mentioned the kind of the tech players and, and media currently is full of examples that are popping up. Take Amazon Care uh, spreading across the US market and then delivering their services also for other companies, um, innovating um, Alexa together, also now kind of bringing healthcare and elderly care back into the homes. Take Apple uh, together with Biogen, UCLA, uh, University of College of California, um, trying to detect biomarkers in neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's, which is mm -hmm. also part of your yep. remit and also Parkinson's, but also take um, Google's uh, DeepMind yeah, that uh, via AlphaFold recently um, founded a for-profit company um, that really goes into innovating pharma R&D, which is at the very core of the pharma business model, yeah, innovating new drugs based on algorithms that uh, they they innovated via their alpha fold technology and, and service. With that said, and, and you're referencing that you're partnering with companies such as Microsoft, ultimately, how do you perceive these tech players? Would you rather perceive them as kind of welcomed collaboration partners? Or is it more that um, they are ultimately um, kind of a threat to traditional healthcare companies and someone who will disrupt um, the, the, the sector for, yeah, for the next years. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't want it to seem like a cop-out answer, but my answer is yes, I see them as an opportunity and I see them as a threat, right? Yeah. It's uh, in terms of disruption, <laughs> right? So um, I, I think the, the cycle, yeah. you know, the cycle's been evolving and, and maybe many years back, um, the consensus opinion was opportunity, right? And then kind of there was this kind of swing towards maybe there's a threat and there was kind of the kind of 
a peak and a crescendo of of tech interest in in health and i think now the, the pendulum's come back to more of a, a midpoint where the answer is more nuanced right i think we're getting to an era of smarter partnerships right where it's not just any tech company and any healthcare company but matching the right capabilities and that's core of our strategy at ucb2 right where are we credible legitimate as leaders Whereas a tech company got the right technology, where did they have something no one else has? And how does that fit with the need of a particular patient population? It's, it's, not, it's not one size fits all. Um, and so based on who has the unique capabilities um, to, to, together um, unlocking something, I think that becomes a, an opportunity. I think there are examples, um, for example, if we talk about um, stratification and prediction, right? Um, there may be disruption uh, as technology uh, changes where and how key decisions are made about which which prescription a patient is given, right? So the decision-making authority of the physician, but also the reimbursement analyses of, of, of payers. Um, but equally, that, say, that disruptive influence is highly likely, I think, to amplify the value of existing and new medicines, right? By, by better illuminating for which patients uh, it creates the most value. So even on a, a single issue like, like stratification of response, you can see disruption because of, let's say, disintermediation of physician, right? Which would itself kind of uh, um, certainly uh, significantly change the, the, the healthcare model for biopharma. But, but clearer, clearer demonstration of value is, is a boon to something we've been struggling with for a long time. So th that's why I think the answer is not cut and dried. In terms of... Um, of the application of AI in, in R&D, I would say mostly to date, it's been augmentation rather than disruption, right? I mean, a lot of what we're doing is is AI driven in um, whether it be in protein folding or understanding uh, key targets. Maybe it's naive to think, but, I, but moving from the AI piece, right? So understanding the nature of the target or designing an antibody or, uh, or molecule um, to actually putting it in the lab, um, doing the early re wet research, the translational medicine, the early development, I, I, still see more, I still see more opportunity than I see threat, right? Um, I don't want to say I, um, I'm not dismissive of the threat. I think it's, it, it's real in terms of its disruptive potential. Um, but if I try to make a kind of balanced equation of the upside for us versus the downside for us, I see more upside. I see more, more partnership upside than I see business encroachment. And um, um, I'm with you. Uh, um, ultimately, there is a lot of upside for us as humans and society. Uh, time will tell uh, how well these partnerships will play out. And uh, in my eyes, how much you come together on a, on a really eye-to-eye -eye level um, as a pharma company with the immensely big tech players together yes. with universities, university clinics, regulators. In my eyes, this is where really innovation will happen eventually going forward. And, yeah. and, and these perspectives need to be coming together, however, on really an eye to eye level. And yeah. everyone is kind of having the same ticket to the party yeah? Yeah. And, 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 and really come together um, like minded. And yeah. that, that will be, to me, the trick of really innovating for the good. I think, yeah, and I think a couple of other um, interesting aspects will be one, it will be a real test of, of how well companies know themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, to kind of fulfill what I, I mentioned, where I still think there's more opportunity than threat, the partnerships have to be based on, um, let's say, UCB, in UCB's case, right, us playing where we have true competitive advantage, where we're really strong, right, and, and have something that, that others can't offer. Right, which requires us to see ourselves clearly, mm -hmm. right? And if we're wrong about that, if there's hubris in that evaluation, right? If we love ourselves too much and we think that we've got something that no one else can offer, but it turns out a tech company can end run around it or find another partner, then then there's a real threat. But if if we're really disciplined in our strategy and understand clearly, right, where we have where we can do things that others can't, right, where, where there would be a long and difficult barrier for them to acquire the same capabilities then I think we have a kind of core business to hold on to and a really attractive kind of set of partnership models. The, the other thing that I think is interesting is whether AI will kind of jump the next hurdle uh, with, with ease in terms of, and I think healthcare is a great example of this. So 
still most of the data that that AI is AI algorithms are crunching is kind of laid out in a fairly um, kind of linear way, right? I mean, the, the data may be more or less structured, but it's just tabulated data sets, right? I think a lot of the advancement in healthcare, especially if we go back to our prior conversation about etiology and understanding root causes and advances in, in, in really how we understand medicine, right? State of the art in representing that kind of information is uh, knowledge is in graph, right? With yeah. edges and vertices and nodes and in kind of that graph theory network. And that AI hasn't quite mastered, you know, how to train algorithms and, um, and optimize uh, predictions and discoveries on that kind of data. So I think that's kind of the next frontier for, for healthcare is to see whether AI is capable of that. Again, a bit of a bias I have. I think a lot of the advancement in, in AI over the last couple of decades is based on uh, data density and computational power. The, the core nature of the algorithms, at least not an expert, but to my eyes hasn't changed radically since, you know, 1970s. Um, but it would need to, to kind of jump that next hurdle in, in terms of uh, moving healthcare into kind of really tackling et etiology and prevention. And Ben, during the last episode, also referenced that you can only train the AI to be a powerful AI if you have the right data set to train them on. Yeah? Um, and uh, only if there is enough wet biology data, then eventually you can read patterns into that data. Looking at um, at those tech players that we just referenced now and kind of uh, you referencing them as... Uh, Yeah, hopefully welcome collaboration partners and fruitful collaborations spinning off from that, uh, but at the same time also disruptors and, and kind of a threat to traditional healthcare companies. If there would be one characteristic you as a pharma company, as UCB, could borrow from those big tech players, what would that be in your eyes? So I think, uh, sorry to be evasive, but I, I think the, for me, it's, it's, there's not one, right? Um, Our strategy is more really um, looking at it in a different way, which is each population is unique. What they need is is unique, and each tech player brings something different to that game. So it's a it's a mix and match strategy, right? So rather than taking one characteristic from a tech company, it's about in this population, right? What would best complement our medicine and further unlock a, a unique outcome for that for that patient. And the answer is going to be different in a Parkinson's population, in an epilepsy population, in a um, psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis population, for example, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's a it's a mix and match for us, and it's a realization. In I mean, in the premise of your question, which I agree with, they bring a lot to the table that, that we don't have, right? So we have um, we have a good example recently where we developed. Um, We developed some work in uh, fracture detection, t detection to, to aid fracture prevention, ultimately. Um, so we have a tool called BoneBot, which um, we've now worked with uh, Image Biopsy Lab to, to further develop because they're the ones that have the tech capacity mm -hmm. to, to take it on, right? So they have characteristics that we don't have, right? But I don't want to borrow their expertise in, in that technology, right? I, I want to work because their expertise, honestly, is not going to help our, our patients in psoriasis that much, right? Um, a different company will have will have tools that that, that, that come to bear, but I have um, a slightly uh, cheeky answer for you if you push me to say to take one characteristic from a tech I company. Have asked for that actually. Yeah, if, you, if you're pushing <laughs> if you're pushing for one, then the characteristic I'll, I'll take from either Apple or Amazon is cash on hand. Cash on hand, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, but that's a good one. No one can deny that actually. I guess right. Um, but uh, ultimately, it boils down also. You need to know yourself as a company very well uh, but you also need to stay true to the capabilities of your company that you bring and and not try to bend too much but also openly collaborate and ask for collaboration help from others that are much better in some of those disciplines needed to advance the future of health james what a rich dialogue and and, and clear perspectives that you brought really big thanks for for shedding light here for you personally but also for ucb as a company i i truly enjoyed the dialogue that we just had and by now i do understand what you mean by uh, you being a scientist by training but a philosopher at heart so with that said really big thanks i i, I truly enjoyed it i enjoyed it too thanks for the opportunity 
So what a great start into the new year 2022. Thanks a lot for listening in. I hope you really enjoyed it as much as I did. And I'm already looking forward to upcoming episodes also this year. However, until then, stay tuned and most importantly, stay safe and take care. Bye bye. Strategy and strategy made real.